In the new year, many of us are motivated by the fresh start. Some of us resolve to be more grateful, more present, aka naturally happier. But could it be that consistent happiness is actually unnatural? Could it be that the expectation of an always happy state is a politicized agenda? Not politicized in the sense of electing leaders, but in the sense of saying what's popular. My next guest is a PhD researcher and author. Since becoming unconvinced by prevailing theories on human behavior, she has done a lot of research, everything from monkeys to the mafia. <laughs> now, she's not only helping people hack their brain, she's shedding light on how the altruistic outlook may be popular, but ultimately damaging. Today, she's going to help us untangle the unquestioned as we ask, if our brain's default is unhappiness, why are we encouraged to see it as a tragedy? Advocate of Honest Academia, returning guest, fellow curiositor, Dr. Loretta Bruning. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being coming back. What a fabulous introduction. Thank you so much. It was so original and it raised about 200 questions, right? <laughs> right. Well, your book raised about 200 questions and... Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get into it with you because I think the idea that our brain's natural state is unhappiness and that happiness is a complex skill sounds so backwards. But but why does that sound so backwards to us? Why is that like so confronting? Because we've already been trained and you could even say indoctrinated to believe the opposite that happiness is the automatic default state and everyone should just be happy effortlessly. And if you're not, then it's evidence that something has gone wrong. Now, why do we have this belief? First, we're told that it's the science and the disease model of mental health is what we always hear that says that the normal person is happy. And if you're not happy, then treatment will make you happy. But I go back a few hundred years to the sort of mind meme beneath all of this. And if you think about what Jean-Jacques Rousseau said, that nature is happy and civilization is the root of all unhappiness. So he was a philosopher. He said that because it was popular. He said it because of a very specific situation in his time period in the late 1700s. And yet the popularity and, and embroiled this in, and embedded this into all of our academic thinking. And that's why you believe the science says it. You talk about academia as one of the neighborhoods, if you will, where the Rousseauian belief has injected itself. And I want to kind of cover these neighborhoods because they're all over. But I, my first question, since you brought up the academia part of it, is why, if this is a university thing, are we who have not attended a university affected by it? So first, it's the medical model of life. You are condemned as a bad person, evil and stupid, if you question the medical model, which says that unhappiness is a disease. And so whether you've been to a university or not, well, high school, it's, it's definitely penetrated in high school. And it's also a political belief, the idea that our society has robbed your happiness and messed things up. And if it weren't for our society, we would all be happy effortlessly. And when, again, just to repeat, that's a belief. You have a right to your beliefs, but this is being forced on you as the science. So are we to think that society has no part to play in our states of unhappiness? Everyone makes that choice, but my point is that you're really not helping yourself when you blame your unhappiness on society because that makes you a powerless victim where I'm unhappy, society has to get fixed, I have to get fixed, there's nothing I can do. And when you feel powerless, then you just have more unhappiness than the natural default state. You're creating that own unhappiness. Whereas when you say, Unhappiness is natural. We're all born crying. Animals fight. Children's fight. Hunter-gatherers fight. But I can build skills to feel at peace despite this natural default state. 
Okay, that I, that is such a clear way of explaining it because it's like outsourcing the uh, ability building. to be happy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, skill building. Well, I think, I mean, I'm one of these people. Like the the part of your book that was talking about the that challenge the nature is happy. I mean, you have that sort of theme throughout the whole book, the Rousseauian beliefs, but the specific parts of your book that were like, you know, just because you take a walk in the woods doesn't mean... <laughs> And you feel happy does it does it mean that that's not the way and and that you're living in a in a concrete suburb is the cause of all of your unhappiness? That really challenged me because I am that barefoot in the woods kind of a lady, and we'd all tend to romanticize to some degree nature knows best, even as far back as to hunter gatherer societies. I could see how you could believe it, but if I may, because we're all mammals and we want to be in the one-up position. And if you get to have a life where you leave that concrete suburb and you live as a barefoot girl in the woods, then you feel like you're in the one-up position. Like, look at what a great life I have. I, I am superior to people who live in the burbs. And so we all build our identity around whatever it is that we think we've done that's better than the common man. And then if you change your beliefs, then you lose your one-up position. So what I say is, imagine you're on a tropical island and you think, oh, fish are going to just jump in my lap. Water, clean, healthy water is going to just appear. I'm going to be nice and warm and cozy all the time, even when it's 50 degrees out at night. I'm going to have to find fire. Like you think it's going to be easy, but it's not. And actually a lot of um, like hunter gatherers, even if they have plenty of fruit, then they have protein malnutrition if you don't get enough protein. So the bottom line is it takes constant effort to meet your survival needs in the state of nature. And our ancestors had all these woes or worse because they literally had a risk of starving. So if we think that we would just be effortlessly happy all the time, if we lived in the state of nature, then it's, a, it's, it's a delusion that's really fed, fed by, I think, false information constructed by academics who get rewarded and promoted and celebrated if they feed this delusion. I was so interested in your book when you t talked about the comparison of the countries and when we read about happiness and, oh, X country is happier than why country? You know, as a as a red blooded American, I feel a little irritated at not being kind of in the top rung of things, and so it makes me feel bad when I read about these countries that are doing things in a way that makes their society happier. I think, oh gosh, we're doing it wrong. But you had some interesting insight into how these happiness studies are conducted and how the data is collected. Yeah. Can you share about yeah. that? I think yeah. it'll be, be a big relief for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Well, not everyone. So first I have to say that I am not saying America should be number one because I have listeners all over the world. So, so that's not the point. The point is that it's very easy to manipulate statistics to make whatever you want come on top. So you can... If you're a surfer, you could say countries with the best surfers are the happiest, and then you could find some kind of indicator that puts those countries on top. And so, long story short, the people who construct these indicators are generally socialists, and they find some kind of socialist indicator that puts that country on top, which it has been the Scandinavian countries pretty much since these indicators were created, the indicators of quote unquote happiness as opposed to the ones of longevity, which are now getting more attention. So I don't want people to confuse that. But if you used an indicator like alcoholism and suicide, then the quote unquote happy countries, they have lots of alcoholism and suicide. And not to mention, they have a lot of treatment and they still have a lot of alcoholism and suicide. You mentioned in the book that the, the cultural dynamic has an impact on how the data is interpreted as well, something I never considered. Not how the data is interpreted, but your personal physiological sensations are interpreted. So if I have a clipboard and I come up to you and I say, 
Meredith, how happy were you in the past five days? And you have to check a box like strongly agree, strongly disagree. <laughs> so you're having to make a subjective decision. So in some cultures that you say, yeah, I was happy because you live in a culture where you're not supposed to complain, which just happens to be the socialist Scandinavian countries. But in the United States, in today's culture, if you say, yeah, I'm happy, that that sounds like you're entitled and lacking in compassion for all the suffering of other people. So you don't say you're happy. You say you're, you're unhappy. And then if you say you're unhappy, then everyone says, oh, yeah, now, now you're one of us because you're sharing this like what this terrible life that we this burden that we all have to carry. So that's culture interpreting the cortisol that every brain triggers. Okay, so every brain has this cortisol, but we uh, personally interpret it differently based on lots of factors, including the culture of where we live. Yes. 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 This is so not what anybody ha has ever shared with me before. This is so interesting. Yeah. Okay. So unhappiness as our natural state, would you go as far to say that unhappiness is an important feeling to have for a human? It's important information. Anytime your results are below expectations, your brain releases cortisol, the unhappy chemical. And it's just below expectations. So that's not necessarily a tragedy or a crisis, but it's sort of like, imagine you're a monkey and you climb to the top of the tree and you think you're gonna get some fabulous reward. And then when you get there, it's like a, a fruit that's no good. Then that releases your threat chemical that says, oh, your need for fruit, your need for calories is not going to be met if you do what you just did. And that paves a neural pathway that stores the information. And our body is designed to get as much reward as possible for our effort. So anytime you try to do something and you fail, you get that cortisol that says, okay, learn from that. And you can make a huge deal of it. And that my classic example from daily life is if you have to do some boring task online, like renew your driver's license or something, and you go there and you think, I can do this in five minutes, and then a half hour later, it's still not done. Like, oh, I get so upset. So then I have to tell myself, I created that because I thought it would take five minutes. So my expectations were wrong. I keep thinking of the word higher mammal. Like this is higher mammal stuff, you know, like... <laughs> It's, it's almost like the expectation mismatch is us living in our lower primal states and you're trying to, to invite us up. Invite us up, everyone. <laughs> well, the simple answer to that is that our core neural pathways, the highway system in your brain is formed before age eight. So we're all running on those before age eight neural pathways. Then we have another peak of neuroplasticity in adolescence. So we're all running on high school brain. So when you talked about your quote unquote culture and everyone, you know, when they talk about the culture, they want to blame the country or social media or something. But a lot of that culture that's wired into you is whatever your mirror neurons observed when you were seven year old, years old and smaller and in high school. That's how you learned what to expect and how to get what you expect or more. I want to go back to the neighborhood that we were visiting just a moment ago when we were talking about these studies. Another example of something in that comparison neighborhood, we were talking about comparisons of happiness country to country, is comparisons person to person. And this was so good from your book. I just have to read the quote because I love it so deeply. You said most professors got good grades in school, which gave them a one up in their 
one up position in their myelin years. But in adult life, good grades may not lead to a one up position. Academics are often horrified to see social recognition go to people they deem less intelligent. They can't admit that they have the same status urges as other mammals, so they interpret their own one down feelings as compassion for others. This pro-social rationale rewards them with a nice one-up feeling until the next time they see a less educated person get social recognition. Then they have to spark more serotonin with more thoughts of their moral superiority. Oh my gosh. Let me, can I just tell you why I like this so much? For one, it's totally taboo. Yes, it is. And I, you know, like on one level, I'm afraid of like, you know, bananas are going to get thrown at me or something. But I said all of this in two previous books, and I'm still here. So those two previous books are Status Games and I Mammal. But yeah, each book, yeah. I was like, I got to say it more directly. So this time I said it really directly. Yeah. And no, of course, fabulous. I was a college professor for 25 years. And before that, I spent most of my years, you know, in college and grad school, my adult life. So, you know, it's not like I'm just pointing fingers at other people. And my husband is at no. an academic too. So, <laughs> Well, and here's the second reason why I love this so deeply is because I do this and I am not a college professor, nor did I attend a university. So I want to share how I do it in case the listener might relate to this because it's so easy when we interpret information like this to think, oh, that's for those other people. Like, well, I'm here to tell you it's at least for me because I didn't always do great in school, but I prided myself on always doing things the air quotes right way, no shortcuts. Mm -hmm. So my version of this is when I see people succeed with more ease, I tell myself, oh yeah, they must have cheated because it makes me feel better. It makes me like applaud myself as a soon to be recognized underdog for whatever it is that I'm doing. Well, first, Everyone thinks they're an unfairly overlooked underdog. And the simple way I explain this in all of my books, and I think this one too, is the brain naturally wants to be special. We are born with an urge to be special and we have life or death feelings about it because when you're a baby, you can't meet your own needs. So if you're not getting special attention, you'll die. But then in adulthood, 8 billion other people want to be special as much as you do. So we all feel like our one eight hundredth, one eight billionth of a share of specialness is not enough. And so we have to find a way to justify how we deserve more. And again, all of my books talk about how we deserve more. And so then anything that threatens your specialness becomes a survival threat. So even like I, you know, I talk a lot to alcoholics. A lot of them pride themselves on, I can hold my liquor better than you can. So if they were to stop drinking, they lose their main source of pride. However, I have to say as a lifetime college professor that there is a lot of cheating and you're probably right that they did better by cheating. Well, I, I, I appreciated that you shared that in your book because it was a realistic wake up call for my own perspective on progress and success and personal achievement. And I love that you just said that when our own specialness feels threatened, we, we react, right? We have a response to that. And your book, Biology Versus Politics, is about how that natural urge is sometimes, maybe not more than sometimes, <laughs> it's, it's frequently leveraged in political arenas and not necessarily to get votes as we established, but to gain popularity, which in a way is votes, right? Yes, exactly. Popularity is a taboo word because no one wants to acknowledge that they care about it. No one wants to acknowledge that they cared about it when they were young. And no one wants to acknowledge that they still carry the pain of not being popular when they were young. But it's a huge core motivator in life. Yeah. So how can being aware of our biology versus the politics help us in our daily lives? Because as I just said, you know, I, I realized in this one department of my life, in the comparison department, the comparison neighborhood, that a shift in this perspective can help me 
and not feeling behind, you know, not feeling like I'm missing out or I'm not number one or whatever. How else can people be helped by shifting their perspective to understand that their brain's default state is to be unhappy? Each of us has an unhappy default state that's wired by our unique individual experience. So it's not as if it's a genetic template. Like the genetic is like, yeah, we're all born crying. We all feel physiological needs. Animals all have unhappy cortisol surges, hunter gatherers, and children. Because in the book, I talk about how we're told that animals, children, and hunter gatherers are happy all the time. So all of this unhappiness is always there but I'm not saying it's the same in everyone. So the first thing is to find your own pattern. Like when I'm unhappy, it's like, oh, I see how that's the same basic unhappiness as when I was a kid. That tells me that I have this template and it's filtering in information that reinforces my old fears, you know, threat sensations and ignoring other information where someone else could see the situation in a different way, but they're just filtering in what, fit, what fits their old pain. But the simple solution is like in daily life, let's say I'm in a meeting and I raise my hand and I say, blah, blah, blah. And I'm really hoping that someone is going to say, oh, yes, that was brilliant. Let's all do that. Let's dismiss the meeting early and just get it done. But that never happens. Most of the time, I'm in a meeting, I raise my hand and I say something and no one seems to have any reaction at all. And then I feel bad. And so I have to say, okay, I'm creating that bad feeling. And everyone else in this meeting is feeling the same way, that they want recognition and they want the whole meeting to applaud their view of the situation. And as frustrating as it is, I... If I want to be in this group, that's the reality of life. And I don't have to be in the group. And that's how I explain how animals, they're always deciding, do I want to be in this group or not? And we're given this false view that being in a group is like unlimited happiness. If that were true, then we wouldn't have the problems we have. You mentioned, I created this. You've said that a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And you say that in your book quite a few times yeah. as well. In yeah. fact, you shared that you were seeing a therapist, a few therapists, mm -hmm. and it wasn't until like the third one would that you believed the feedback that they were giving you that you were in fact creating your own unpleasurable experience in this life. Yes, because our verbal brain is so good at coming up with evidence. And today that's the focus of everything is I can prove to you it's not my fault it's that you don't like me and you are purposely ignoring my brilliant ideas. We can always make a great case why I really deserve more attention and it's unfair that I didn't get it. And everyone else is doing the same thing. <laughs> so then that's another neighborhood is therapy and organized religions. They have the Rousseauian beliefs kind of intertwined in there, which I can understand from a business model perspective, you would depend on people needing and wanting to return and be, if you will, repeat customers in order to maintain a business. And they're competing with, with all these other information sources. And I wouldn't say all religions because some religions don't say this, you know, they don't say, you know, you'd be happier on a tropical island. Some religions, I think, do acknowledge that there's a core unhappy state. But what I talk about therapy, politics, medicine, and the media and academia, that they, they are all selling this, you should be happy effortlessly message. I think people would understand the, the medicine one for sure, because more and more folks are becoming aware that there's an overly medicalized perspective of our well-being. So I would in, I instead kind of want to visit the neighborhood of the media because you had such a, a fresh perspective on it. No one would disagree, however, that the media is inflammatory. I think everyone's kind of on board with that. But 
to view it from the perspective of brain chemicals is a fresh perspective. So I'm, again, going to read from your book. <laughs> you, you said, when you feel threatened, scanning for more information about the threat helps you feel safe. The media feeds our natural urge to predict threats by supplying a steady stream of threat <laughs> signals. You spark oxytocin when you join a conversation about the latest threat. You enjoy serotonin when you feel better informed than others, and when you read media attacks about powerful people. You enjoy dopamine when the news helps you predict what will come next. I thought that was so fascinating because these things are happening so quickly in our brains and in our bodies. We don't really, we don't really know that it's happening, but it, it is a helpful insight, I think. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, as we as you brought up in the beginning, it doesn't help to blame the media for manipulating you because you are offering them your brain and letting, you know, you don't have to do that. You don't have to let them construct your thoughts. You can take charge and construct your own thoughts. But then you may not want to do that because then you'd have to not think the same as everyone else who is just reading the headlines and saying how awful life is. Well, that was my question is the whole problem with the media. I mean, is it just always going to be there because that's the way our mammal brain prioritizes negative information? Or, I mean, do you see what I mean? If we can't blame the media <laughs> and and we instead just blame the 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 biology of our mammal brains, how do, how do we get news? <laughs> how are we supposed to do this? <laughs> Well, I don't know how much news you need. I don't really need any news at all. I used to limit my news to the headline that was in the little box as I walked down the street, and now they don't even have those boxes anymore. No, I mean, really, I, I avoid the news. If there were an emergency, I'd hear about it. But I focus on things I can control. And anything I can't control, I don't fill my mind with it. So I don't know if you're thinking about media for, for pleasure or social responsibility or social connection? What, what are you thinking? Well, I'm just thinking about the listener um, that might just have that question, might just go, well, geez, what am I supposed to do? You know, not because oh, I'm oh, on board okay. with you. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Because okay. I'm with you, Loretta. Like I subscribe to the SKIM, S-K-I-M-M. -M, so it's, an, it's a news thing. They email you. And when I'm like, hey, I think there's something happening out there in the world, I open it. But most of the time, yeah, I just delete too. it. Yeah, yeah. And But it's wonderful because it says it in plain language, what you need to know. And then and then if I want to know deeper about something, I go search for it on my own. But I'm thinking with the listener in mind, maybe other people aren't like that. Maybe other people have... Here's an example. I have a friend at, who the news is on all the time mm -hmm. in their house. All the time all the time. And I'm not sure what the reason is, but there are emotional impacts from having the news on all the time. Oh, yes. And I'm, you know, and I'm wondering, like, would they experience like a withdrawal? Because all these brain chemicals, yes. this is like druggish, you know? Yes, they would totally experience a withdrawal. But here's what it really is. It's a distraction from your thought loop. Because if you don't have it on, then where's your mind going to go? It's probably going to go to, I'll say it simply, the worst moment of your life <laughs> because that's mm -hmm. what builds the biggest pathway in your brain. So your electricity keeps wanting to flow into the biggest pathways unless you take charge and redirect it. So it's going to flow into worries. Let's just use a, a People like to call it stress, but now stress has been blamed on the world. Like the world is stressed. No, it's worries. You created the worries with you all by allowing your electricity to flow into real physical pathways that were created by your own real experience. And if you listen to the news, a lot of times it's like, oh, well, look at how messed up they are. I've got it together in comparison or some other kind of like maybe they listen to the news and they say, look at all those top dogs, they're so corrupt, whereas I'm a good, honest person. So that puts them in the one-up position. How, or maybe they say, 
I'm afraid to go out of the house. And the news makes me feel like I'm smart for not going out of the house rather than stupid. So however it is that they interpret, it's all about their own neural pathways. And I'm always explaining you can build new neural pathways, but first you have to be aware of them and to accept them and to accept that it's not shameful to be running on neural pathways built in your childhood. It's the inevitable norm. And the news, do you, how do you feel like the news is politicizing our, our natural state? Because there's, this is a real fun topic because it's so nuanced, right? I, I keep going back and forth with, with how I feel about, you know, who's at blame. I can feel my brain trying to pin blame. But it's their fault. But it's thing. their fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like it, like I'm ping ponging in my head right now. If well, it weren't oh, the for them, problem. I'd be happy. And yeah, that them yeah. and that conviction about them. So each individual, however you construct the them, you can say, well, if I think of this as a real highway in my brain, how did that highway get formed? So first, what are the influences in your daily life? Then what were the influences in your adolescence that constructed that template? And then you'll see that there were actually childhood experiences that created a template that's the same shape as your current political beliefs that say, we'd all be happy if it weren't for those jerks. And mm -hmm. without specifying who the jerks are, they're always going to be someone with more power than you because your neural pathways are built when you're a powerless child. And how could you not have negative feelings about whoever this is that has the power to obstruct you, whether it's a possible true cruelty or it's just someone else who had a crush on the person you liked and then they got in the way and they got the person instead. You know, that's a big one too. <laughs> I So... When you talk about the politics of it, what you're suggesting is, let me see if I can summarize this correctly, please. I know you'll correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, and I want you to. Our, our, our mammal brain prioritizes negative information, and certain people, the media, the medical, the, the you know, who are we leaving out? The universities, they are, whether they know it or not, leveraging this natural state of our brains in order to keep us engaged in clicks, in going, repeat business, and Going et back to the next therapy session because people quit therapy as soon as it gets unhappy. So they even have to struggle to make therapy happy. You know? mm. And, you know, some of it, it starts to sound a little dark when, when you start to think about it. But how do you personally not throw the baby out with the bathwater with it? How do you embrace the benefits of things like therapy and yoga and, you know, organized religion and things that we want to interact with? Maybe not, obviously, the news, but the other stuff. Well, I'll give you just a simple practical example. If I look at a list of movies and I look at one and say, oh, that's depressing, that's depressing, that's depressing, it could take me a half hour to find movies that I would find uplifting. And so I do that not on a bad day when I'm in a bad mood, but I do it someday when I have free time so that I have a list available for when I'm in a bad mood that I could have some, something uplifting to access. And so I, I always have like a default plan, like as far as like therapy. So we all wanna feel protected. We all want to feel like, oh, I know somebody that knows more than me. And no matter what problem, you know, we're supposed to say, oh, I can get unconditional support. But we all know that when you go to people for support, they give you suggestions that you don't necessarily agree with. And now you might feel worse. So I have to say that that's in me that, like, how come I don't know anybody that could solve this problem is because... My problem is so specific to me. So then I have to break it down into separate parts and say, okay, I'm going to ask these three different people and not get upset that no one of them can rescue me because my urge to be rescued is left over from my childhood. 
And I can just be grateful to get these three different opinions from the three people that I might have, I think might have some perspective on my problem. Mm, interesting. As we close, do you have any more thoughts or tips on how people could possibly rewire their brains to, to not outsource their happiness? Yeah. Well, so the core strategy in the book is to choose a new positive step to take whenever you find yourself going negative. And the positive step is defined by you. So it doesn't mean doing yoga. It means doing something you like that's meaningful to you. But in that moment, let's say you would rather have a cigarette. So playing the guitar doesn't sound like as much fun as as having a cigarette. So you have to reward yourself for, to build the positive habit in the same way that animal training it uses rewards to actually train the animal to repeat the new behavior until it becomes automatic. So I help you develop a list of treats that you can treat yourself for taking these new actions and building these new positive habits. And to go even deeper, I really recommend participate in an animal training experience because it really helps you get in touch with your inner mammal. Well said. And I would add to that, read read your books. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. They, they, it really is, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of embarrassing to say that our own brains that we were born with and the natural state of those brains is such a complex issue that we would have to learn about it. But on the other hand, we are those higher mammals that can hack our own happiness and hack our own brains and reframe situations that would appear threatening in a way that allows us to instead leverage the behaviors that we all have if we're aware of them. And so for that, I am very grateful for you to have this conversation with me. Can you tell people where they can buy your book, do your courses, all the things? Sure. Everything is at my website, innermammalinstitute.org innermammalinstitute.org. And if you sign up for my newsletter, I have a free five-day happy chemical jumpstart where you can get one email for five days on explaining each of the happy chemicals. And the book, of course, Why You're Unhappy, Biology Versus Politics. Thank you again. I appreciate you. Sure. Thank you so much for really reading and digging into it.